for Siege. And welcome to the session. We have some great panelists. Um, Yawande, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, great. Thank you for that. Um, so on our panel today, we have Yawande Yakin Kuobo, a food policy and planner from Baltimore City Department of Planning. We have Nigel Wright, Wright Brown, apologies, executive director of the Black Veg Society, founder and of Vegan Restaurant Week as well. Chef Gregory Brown, CEO, co-owner and head chef of the Land of Kush. Honestly, between the two of you, there are so many accolades. I had to just decide on what was going to be written in as your title. So thank you all for coming and attending this session. And to our audience, welcome. Within this session, we are going to focus on food justice in Baltimore. So low-income neighborhoods, urban areas, and predominantly African-American communities in the city have limited access to healthier food options in stark contrast to their more affluent suburban and predominantly white counterparts. This stark disparity in the availability of nutritious food resources has led to the well-documented problems of food deserts or food swamps, which are especially prevalent in segregated and fragmented urban areas. Furthermore, the lack of adequate, um, pardon me, adequate transportation options exacerbates the challenges faced by these communities. Regrettably, these food deserts and swamps are just symptoms of a larger systematic problem, a fractured and unequal food system. This systematic issue is often referred to as food apartheid where certain communities are systematically denied access to healthy food options and are disproportionately affected by food-related disparities. To address this, there is a growing recognition of the need for food sovereignty, which empowers communities to have control over their own food systems, making nutritious and culturally appropriate food more accessible. This session will also delve into the impact of food apartheid in Baltimore and highlight the importance of achieving food sovereignty as a means to rectify this deeply ingrained problem. So join us for an insightful exploration of food justice issues in Baltimore, Maryland. This session serves as a platform to connect with advocates, experts, and activists dedicated to addressing profound disparities in the city's food justice food systems. This discussion will also draw inspiration from a range of transformative issues, including the Justice 40 initiative, um, designed to confront systemic in inequalities across various domains, notably food access. Now, during the session, our speakers will discuss similar programs and policies aimed at fostering equ equity, assessing their effectiveness and broader implications. Furthermore, our speakers will explore the significance of composting efforts, urban agriculture and permaculture, and delve into dietary choices like plant-based and vegan diets as strategies to address food inequities and promote sustainable practices, highlighting their potential to strengthen communities and enhance resilience. This session welcomes activists, policymakers, food enthusiasts, and anyone concerned about food equity in frontline and fenceline communities. Welcome. Um, I'd like to also just give um, a chance for our panelists to introduce ourselves. Um, Ms. Nigel White Bright Brown, would you like to go first? Sure. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. I'm Nigel White Brown. I go on the land of Kush along with my husband, Gregory Brown. Uh, we are a multi award winning fast casual restaurant in Baltimore. Uh, and I'm also the executive director of Black Veg Society, a co-founder of Vegan SoFest and uh, Maryland Vegan Restaurant uh, Month now. Yeah, what she said. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, my name is Gregory Brown, co-owner of the Land of Kush Vegan Soul Bistro in Baltimore. We're 100% uh, plant-based uh, restaurant. So we do a vegan soul food cuisine, vegan barbecue rib tips, smoked collard greens, candy games, vegan mac and cheese, smoothies, juices, vegan crab cakes, that kind of thing. Um, and we consider ourselves a social enterprise. So part of our mission is not just as a business. Obviously, we want to make money to sustain ourselves, but um, we also see ourselves as uh, social impacting. So part of our mission is to educate people on food and food inequalities and how to eat healthier. 
um, within the city. Thank you. Yawande, do you want to jump in? Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Yawande Akinkwowo, um, and I am the Food Access Planner at the Baltimore City Department of Planning in the Food Policy Office. Oh, okay, so thank you. Um, as I mentioned before, welcome all. Um, so I'm just going to start off a question for all of you. Um, so with terms I mentioned in the session description, I um, spoke on food swamps, food apartheid. Um, so with terms such as food apartheid, which shed light on the cumulative impacts within food environments, how do we collectively move beyond these disparities? And what strategies can propel us towards genuine food justice. And please, anyone feel free to jump in. This is a, a, a question for you all, or whomever. Okay, I'll go. So uh, part, of, part of the issue is, um, like you said, in food swamps, deserts, um, food apartheid situations, part of the issue is education and educating the people on, um, not just giving them options um, and putting markets in place, but also educating them on food preparation, uh, educating them on healthy foods to eat, uh, how to make better decisions around food. I know one of the things that we do at the Land of Kush is we have a free food giveaway every Tuesday in front of the restaurant um, from 4 to 5 p.m. So the, this is produce that is left over or getting ready to be thrown out by markets and other uh, organizations because it's not as fresh um as their incoming fruits and vegetables so but it's still very good i mean i just picked up some asparagus and some oranges um but sometimes there's things like jackfruit out there but it's really just um i think part of it is from a community standpoint is educating people giving them options and showing them how easy it is i mean if you if you don't come from a background if, if you don't come from a background of cooking and preparing fresh foods then all of that is new to you and can be very intimidating. So if um, so, it's up to us as kind of liaisons to the community in educating them on how to prepare food. I mean, if you've never, if you've never really seen a squash before, <laughs> you may have seen a pumpkin before. Um, as we're coming into my pumpkin season, if you you've seen pumpkin before, but you don't know what to do with it, you you may you may just think of Halloween, but you know it's very healthy for you, especially in the upcoming months. So, education is a big piece of it. And I just wanted to add the food giveaway that we were doing at the Land of Kush. We've been doing for years. I think it was uh, since 2017 or 2016, and it's in partnership with an organization, a Baltimore organization called Food Rescue Baltimore. So we are one of several um, hubs, I would say, where they uh, organize this distribution. And it's been very consistent for all of these years. They barely skip any days, you know, based on whether it has to be really bad outside for them to skip a day. So it's been a great partnership and we have lines of people that come and, and get uh, this produce. So um, we are blessed to have this in front of our store for so many years. Wow, yes. Thank you for that. Um, Yawanda, did you want to join? Um, up to you, you know. No yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'll just um, definitely second um, what my fellow, fellow panelists uh, mentioned about education. Um, and that's something that was definitely highlighted to our office um, with our produce box distribution program. So um, we're distributing about 2000 um, produce boxes to community sites across the city of Baltimore. And um, a lot of our uh, partners and point of contacts mentioned that the residents who come to pick up these boxes don't really know about some of the produce that is within the boxes or what to even do with the produce in the boxes. Um, and you know that results in food waste sometimes we've heard where people will just be like, you know, I'm not gonna eat it at home. I don't know how to prepare it. So I'm just like not gonna take the box. Um, and in response to that, what we've um, collectively decided to do is um, put some funding towards some food demonstrations. So virtual food demonstrations showing the residents who pick up the boxes how they can make, um, how they can prepare these foods, how to store these foods, um, but also most importantly is um, how to make like some culturally competent versions of these foods as well. Wow, yes, absolutely, thank you. And you know, from hearing all of your comments, 
education is definitely a standpoint. And so I want to kind of maybe shift into that space and back to you, Gregory. Um, I have to have a couple questions for you. So from an educational standpoint, um, as a board member of the Visit Baltimore Education and Training Foundation, you likely encounter serious myths, various myths, I should say, and misconceptions surrounding veganism. So what key messages or insights do you consider crucial to share with and educate individuals, individuals about veganism? <laughs> uh, I think the, the biggest thing is uh, keeping things very simple. Uh, a lot of times people overcomplicate uh, vegan food. Uh, because they see, you know, Beyond Burger or they see these things in the market, the tofu and stuff like that. But fruit is vegan. You know what I'm saying? Bananas, bananas and uh, oranges and grapes and a lot of these fresh fruits are vegan. You know, things that you can snack on. Salad, most of your, the baseline for a salad is going to be vegan. So um, I try to keep it, I try to make things very simple for people to understand. It's just no animal products that go into our food. Um, so no fish, no turkey, no chicken, no hamburger, none of that stuff. So, um, so we just do plant-based and we also follow, um, we follow very simple guidelines. So it's vegetables, grains, legumes, which are your beans and lentils, things like that, uh, fruits and nuts and seeds. And that's what makes up the vegan diet. So I try to keep it very simple there. I think the biggest question is always, where do you get your protein from? But all of those sources of food, uh, except for maybe fruit are protein sources or have sources of protein. It's just how you mix and match things. Now people will get technical and say, well, okay, you know, it's not a complete protein. Well, if you combine rice with, uh, if you combine grains with legumes, then you'll get your complete protein. So I just try to keep it as simple as possible when educating people about vegan or their myths about vegan. And then the last thing, of course, is about the taste and the flavor of the food. If the food tastes good, then people are more likely to jump on it. I mean, we just had a, uh, a gentleman who came into the restaurant, he just happened to pull up outside of the restaurant. He didn't know what it was. He came in. I had a conversation with him. It turns out he's uh, an individual that's returning home from prison. Uh, he hasn't been out more than three or four weeks. And so, you know, just gave him the service. And he didn't really know what it was. Gave him a brief education, let him taste some of the food. And it was good to him. Made him a smoothie and, you know, OK, he's getting ready to come back to the store. So I think keeping things simple around education and what veganism is, is my mission and goal. To, to Greg's point, and I know you didn't get to the nonprofit piece, but again, I'm associated with the restaurant and uh, the Black Vet Society. And we have six pillars and one of them is the education, uh, the simple veg starter guides that can explain and dispel these type of myths. There's also a guide for African Americans. So it's for us, by us. So it helps you with socializing with family and friends, because a lot of times when people think about going vegan, the first thing they're thinking about is the social stuff. I'm going to lose mm -hmm. all my friends. I'm going to be ostracized. I'm going to be kicked out. But it doesn't have to be that way because <laughs> it took me three years to transition to veganism and it was my journey. And when I go out into the community, it is your journey. We're not going to do the preacher pray thing. It's like, where are you at? We are meeting you where you are on that journey. Do you want holistic health? Do you want to be plant based or do you want to be vegan? And and we're working with you in, in your experience. Wow, yes, absolutely. And I mean, I think the more we talk about food here, especially the restaurant, I'm my mouth is salivating a little bit. So let's let's dive into some questions about the land of Kush. Um, so as husband and wife owners of Baltimore's renowned vegan restaurant, the land of Kush, which is celebrated as the ultimate vegan soul experience. Could you please share with us the backstory of how it came into existence? And um, it's a remarkable hist historical journey, and I guess your historical journey together. Oh. It's a very loaded question. It's it probably is. long, I should say. Uh, I'll try to give you the shortest version of that <laughs> again. Uh, it started out with me. Uh, it started out with me in college, really, when I started at the mighty Morgan State University. Um, I was listening to a rapper called KRS-One who always talked about a vegetarian diet. 
And uh, the summer before my my first semester at Morgan, I read a book called Malcolm X's Autobiography. And there were some dietary things in there about around being Muslim. Not that I was becoming Muslim, but it was just talking about not eating pork. And so I cut out pork that year. And then the following year, uh, KRS-One made a song called Beef, which talked about the um, things that go on in the animal industry uh, in, in terms of producing food and the stress that it causes on animals. So immediately I cut out beef. Um, and so as my journey went along, I wanted to be vegetarian, but I knew no one who was vegetarian. And so uh, after graduating, uh, dang, there's a lot of components. To this. Uh, so uh, just after graduating, I progressed um, just cutting out chicken and turkey. I was down to fish just eating fish. And then I was in a bookstore, I ran across a book uh, that had 500 recipes. And immediately I took it home and I was like, I'm going to be vegan today. That's it. That's all. So I pulled a trash can up to my refrigerator, threw all the food in the trash, uh, fish in the freezer, tub of butter, carton of eggs and milk, threw everything in the trash. And I was like, I'm vegan. Well, this was a Japanese cook book so i grew up in baltimore so most of the food was foreign to me but i stuck with it so things like daikon and shiitake mushrooms were all uh foreign to me even tofu was foreign to me tempeh all that stuff was foreign to me so uh but i stuck with it and and went on the other piece to it was uh i was i was in college and when i graduated i didn't do anything i didn't do anything or get into my degree field i ended up working at a call center which i hated and so i started journaling and in the process of well, in the process of journaling, uh, a church elder who I worked with came up to me and said, write down your questions for God. Listen for the answers. Write down the answers. So in the process of doing that, um, I came up with the idea that I wanted to own my own restaurant. And so um, so I started on that journey because I was bringing food to work and then people started buying food from me because they smell good. Um, and so I had this stuff written down. And then a friend of mine reached out to me and she was like, hey, I'm putting on a, uh, I work for a company that's putting on a free jazz festival in front of City Hall um, every first Thursday in the summertime. And we're looking for a vegetarian vendor. Do you know anybody? And I said, no. Uh, well, let me check. So I asked a couple of restaurants, but they didn't want to do the event because it was too many black people. They said black people won't eat the food. So um, so in that process, I was like, I started looking at my journal. I was like, yo, this is something I want to do. So I called my friend back and said, you know what? I'm going to do it. She was like, all right, cool. So I came out there. The event was from six to 10. I set up the food at six o'clock. By seven o'clock, I was sold out of food. Um, and every time I went out to this event, we would just sell out of food every time. And so I was like, okay, I just need to recoup and get some more money and I can open this restaurant. Like gung-ho, no, <laughs> no, uh, reality behind it but um i guess reality is what you make it so uh i ended up working at verizon wireless where i met this lovely young lady and um we ended up doing uh the african-american heritage festival in 2008 we did artscape and to artscape and african-american heritage festival in 2009 and then i was doing uh what was i doing i was i was uh personal chef services i was vending i was catering plus working 50 hours a week at, at at verizon wireless and so i had to make a decision whether i was going to follow my dream or stay in corporate america and so obviously i chose to follow my dream um actually i sat down with a therapist the therapist was was very helpful in me deciding that the therapist would just flat out ask me what do you want to do and so I said, I want to open this restaurant. So she gave me 30 days off from work. In that time, I found a location for the restaurant, which that's a whole nother story, which my wife helped me decide upon or forced me into deciding upon. <laughs> um, but found a location, came back to work after those 30 days, put it on a two-week notice. Six months later, the land of Kush was open. Okay. <laughs> short enough i mean i knew i mean that was i feel that that was very all-encompassing i'm sure there's more to be fair there's, there's more, there's <laughs> more. Not, not just just that more. he's that. a great story <laughs> greg is great i'm just going to tell you where i fit in i'm a native new yorker hailing from the south bronx housing city project so i know nothing about these type of foods until my mother used to send me to the berkshires in the summer when i was six and that's how i was introduced to eating fresh from the garden that could that was the best experience I ever had and the best thing she can possibly do. But we'll talk about that later on. Uh, I was relocated 
to Baltimore uh, through Verizon Wireless. I worked there for 10 years and um, never thought I would land in, in Baltimore, but but I did. And um, never thought I would be in food service. I was supposed to be on Wall Street, you know, with the stockbrokers and things like that, but 9-11. Um, <laughs> when I was on my journey towards veganism, of course, when you're moving state to state, you got to find your doctor, your dentist and all this stuff. I thought I was in the best health at 33. I was doing my thing, working out, eating eggs and uh, milks and uh, pizzas, but I'm working out. I'm doing my thing. I'm healthy until I was told your cholesterol is so high. <laughs> if you don't do something about it, we're going to place you on meds. I'm holistic. I'm, I don't, I'm, I, I'm a believer that your body can heal itself. So I couldn't do that. So I was on this journey of finding out, well, you know, what am I supposed to do to reduce this cholesterol? And I don't know about any vegetarian, vegan, whatever. I knew about tofu at 23. It was called bean curd to me. Bean curd at 23. That's what I was eating. So I played around with tofu, black, black bean sauce and brown rice. I was into all of that when I was working uh, in New York City. Greg was bringing these uh, dishes to work. We were on the same management team. So that's how I got to know him. He was bringing these dishes to work and he was a very interesting guy. And, you know, like he said, the food was smelling great. So he was introducing me to food. He had barbecue <laughs> sauces and mustard sauces and curry sauces and things like that. And when he talked to me about this dream of opening a restaurant, I said, well, I don't know anything about food service. I was a nightclub promoter and a comedy club promoter. And I was doing all that type of clubbing stuff in New York. But I'm on his journey and I'm passionate about learning more about this vegan stuff or this food or this restaurant. And when I'm passionate about something, I'm going to make things happen. So I think him having his dream and me being passionate about doing something, anything in Baltimore is what made this dream possible. The land of Kush being the first project and then moving on to several other projects after that, that are all equally successful. And that's my story. And then we got married and then we had a kid, you know, well, we had a kid before we got married, but that's, you know, we'll write a book about it. <laughs> all I have to say is been 17 years since we met. So. <laughs> so basically he seduced you with his food. <laughs> uh, no, she stalked me. <laughs> We'll Thank you for that. Um, you know, I'm gonna hand it over to our other panelists, Yawande, so we can get to learn a little bit more about you as well. So, Yawande, can you tell us a little more about your role as a food actress planner in Baltimore City, in the Baltimore City Department of Planning, and what it really entails? Yeah, sure. Um, so I joined the team about um, a year and a half ago, so fairly new. Um, but my title is food access planner, and I would I would describe my um, my position as you know connecting the community with food. Um, so one of the projects that I manage is called the Produce Box Distribution Program, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, but that is fun. That's actually um, funded through ARPA funds, so um, the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, so our office was awarded um, over eleven million dollars. Um, to implement some food, uh, some food access programming, or some um, what's the word I'm looking for, just to uh, improve the food system in uh, Baltimore City. So one of the programs funded by that is the um, the produce box distribution program. Um, so with that program, we are partnered with the Common Market, which is a regional produce grower. Um, they're located in Philly, but they do source a lot of their produce um, from Baltimore City, which is why we really fought to um, work with that vendor. Um, and we distribute, um, through them, we distribute um, about 2,000 boxes uh, per week uh, across the city of Baltimore. And we uh, partner with community organizations, churches, and rec centers to help with that distribution. Um, during the pandemic, actually, the program was a lot more larger um, because the program was funded through FEMA. Um, so we were doing about 8,000 boxes a week at that time. Um, another one of my um, roles on the team is uh, facilitating our food pack meetings. So these are quarterly meetings that um, anyone who's interested in food access in Baltimore City can join. Um, they'll learn about uh, some citywide updates from organizations like the um, Maryland, um, Maryland Hunger Solutions, um, as well as Baltimore City Health Department and um, schools gives an update as well. 
Um, it's basically just a, a place for information sharing. We also have breakout sessions where um, entrepreneurs or um, uh, anyone who has something that they want to share with the community and get feedback on, maybe they have a survey or a new study that they want to um, share or get feedback on, they can do that at Food Pack. Thank you. I mean, you said you started about six months ago, but it certainly sounds like you're <laughs> making uh, an impact or, you know, name for yourself. So congrats. That sounds um, you. very impactful work that you are doing. And I do want to follow up with a question, um, yeah. again, a Baltimore question. Um, Baltimore, like many cities, does face a lot of challenges related to food access. So what are the, some of the key issues um, that you, your team has been addressing and what strategies um, have you implemented to tackle them? Yeah, so I think one of the key issues that has come up a lot um, would be um, there's many different um, components to access, but I think one that we've been hearing a lot is um, transportation being one, like actually people getting to the food or getting food to the people that need it. Um, so one of the one of the um, pillars or part of our um, ARPA programming is um, this uh, program called Be More Fresh. Um, so it is essentially an online uh, SNAP incentive program. So uh, residents who are um, eligible for SNAP benefits can order their groceries online um, through one of our three partnered retailers being Amazon, um, sorry, Amazon, Giant, and Safeway. Uh, so they can order their groceries and then have them delivered um, if they don't have transportation or um, pick up the groceries. Um, we're also, um, also something that we've um, really been um, fo trying to focus on too is limited access in the older adult community. So figuring out how we can um, either one, get funding to um, maybe have some sort of um, like large van that can come to um, these um, elderly uh, sites, older adult homes and pick them up and take them to get groceries or um, whether it be through community efforts and uh, working with community organizations to do so. Wow, thank you for that, Yawande. And I, before I turn over to um, Naisha, I have one more question for you, and then, you know, of course, we'll stick with that. Um, so how, what are your thoughts on urban agriculture and permaculture? And um, we know that, well, some of us know that it not only how does it actually, sorry, apologies, let me rephrase. How, what are your thoughts on urban agriculture, permaculture, and how does, how do they not only address food justice issues, but also provide opportunities for workforce, workforce development within Baltimore? Apologies for that. Is that, that's my question? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, so um, our office does do some urban agriculture work. Um, with the ARPA funding, we actually do have a goal to build the local food supply chain through urban agriculture. So we're working with um, Farm Alliance um, and they have a, um, a farm incubator where they're teaching uh, people who are interested in farming how to grow their own produce um, and then taking it a step further and teaching them how they can actually sell that produce um, wholesale. Um, and I, uh, like I mentioned, early, as I mentioned earlier with um, uh, the common market, which is where we source our produce for the boxes, we actually put them in contact with the Farm Alliance um, who grows produce uh, in the city and they have begun to source produce from um, the Farm Alliance. Absolutely, wow. Thank you, thank you for that. I know you're you, your mouth might be dry right now. I had to get hit you with the three questions so you know everybody can have a chance to speak. Um, and Naija, this one is for you. Um, as one of the co-creators of Vegan Soul Fest and Maryland Vegan Restaurant Week, considering that Vegan Soul Fest recently took place August 19th to, 20, to the 20th, this 2023, can you share some info, insights into these events and explain their significance within our communities today? Yes, absolutely. Um, so Vegan Soul Fest was the first um, special event plan that uh, I, I, I co-partnered with uh, 
friend of mine, Brenda Sanders, who's executive director of Afro Vegan Society. Brenda happened to be at the Land of Kush trying to plan for a conference. And of course, Land of Kush was going to cater it. But that all changed when we sat down and talk about, talked about the need for a cultural vegan fest. So we've been going to a lot of festivals. I've been to a lot of festivals. And a lot of times it's commercialized around, you know, certain products to buy. But you know, it, we didn't feel we were in a safe space at these events. So we just sat down and talked about the need to have something that represented us and in the city of Baltimore, not in the county, but in the city of Baltimore, because Baltimore needs the, the education around um, the vegan movement. So in three and a half months, we would have the inaugural vegan soul fest in a two story building where we thought we would have 30 vendors and just a few hundred attendees, but then we found out when we opened up registration and started the campaign, people were signing up to vend like, you know, just in droves. And we had close to a hundred vendors that first year and close uh, over a thousand, close to 1500 attendees. Yeah. So, um, and it's our first time planning this festival. So I, I don't know anything about festival planning and neither did Brenda, but you know, we, we were like, okay, are we going to do this again? Well, this, the Baltimore sun happened to be driving by that day. They didn't know what was going No one knew what was going on out there. They just saw a lot of people and there was a lot of stuff happening. And it was Dan Roderick who ran the story, the new food festival. So we would then have another one but obviously not at that location. So <laughs> that's how Vegan Soul Fest started. And it was based on a need to solve a problem in the community uh, where, as we saw, we solved it. People were looking for that type of fest. So we had worked with um, Baltimore City Community College to do the following three years of the festival, and then it outgrew Baltimore City Community College. And so if you think about the college campus, we had the campus, we had the cafeteria, we had the auditorium, and we outgrew that. Uh, it was a free festival uh, for several years. And then we know you took a break. We took a break during COVID and then post-COVID funding, a lot, all of our funding, if not most of it comes from animal rights organization. I, I see something about the Justice 40. I knew nothing about it until I got into this room and saw the questions and looked it up. We don't get funding from federal. We get funding from private donors and it's animal rights and anything, any uh, foundations that are into the food justice system that want to put money into marginalized communities. Those are people that we get money from. That's who, who we work with. Uh, and then recently visit Maryland because we are bringing tens of thousands of people into the city of Baltimore. So now it's an economic benefit because these people are spending dollars at restaurants and businesses in the city. So that's Vegan Soul Fest and that's how that started. So now it's a ticketed event because we have to raise money to keep the event growing and sustaining at the level it's at now. It was epic this year. It was a lot overwhelming. So the next one is definitely going to need major funding to continue on. Vegan Restaurant, uh, well, start at Be Baltimore Vegan Restaurant Week. The need for that, that was a personal need. I was eating at a restaurant where my brother-in-law was doing a marketing presentation. This restaurant was in Fells Point. And I just asked the waiter to take some, I think it was the goat cheese or something off of a salad. And this was like the biggest production in this restaurant. And I was so offended. I was so offended <laughs> that when I left there, I'm like, okay, what am I going to do about this? You know, so I'm just thinking like, this is another problem that needs to be solved. Okay. He, they told me to go around the corner and eat at the vegan restaurant that was around the corner. They were referring to liquid earth. Um, so I went to this restaurant in Hamden called Golden West. I had not been to this restaurant in several years. The first time I went, they had a barbecue tofu that was okay. It was, uh, it was all right. You know, I'm done with, with so much of the tofu. I went back there after five years and they were doing a vegan week. And I was so confused. I'm like, why is this restaurant that's not even vegan doing a vegan week up in here? The food was amazing. So me... Special event planning. Hey, would you like to take this concept outside of this restaurant and do it big? And I made the owner's day. They were like, we were one. This is exactly what we wanted to do. So Baltimore Vegan Resta Restaurant Week started. 
and then it became restaurant weeks and then it became well let's see what we can do and get some other restaurants outside of the city involved and then it became maryland restaurant uh week and now it's month because wow. the demand so that's how those two start so that's the business to business getting more plant-based options on the plates of restaurants that are interested in understanding that they're serving uh, an underserved market and then they can grow their revenue if they add more plant-based options because the industry is growing. People are looking for more plant-based dishes on the menu. We don't eat at vegan restaurants all the time. We go out and eat at other restaurants. We want to see vegan options on the menu, plant-based options. So that's how that started. So it's twice a year, uh, spring and summer. Mm. Mark Kandas, everyone. <laughs> the first time I, I looked you both up, I had to research you for the podcast episode, the Food Justice episode. And I was like, this place looks good. The restaurant week. I love regular restaurant week. So I definitely am going to mark that on my calendar. Um, you are all, all three of you are also impressive. I will stay clear of the Justice Body question. Um, <laughs> And so I guess I have one for both of you as executive director and director of Black Veg Society. Can you speak more on the food justice work that you do within the city besides what you already shared with the audience? Well, the nonprofit was definitely something that uh, Greg uh, encouraged us to get into. But the way it started was because we were so successful with the restaurant, we had loyal customers and one customer in particular had a Facebook group called Black Vegetarian Society of Maryland. And this customer kept wanting to push this group onto us, but we were still dealing with a lot of the restaurant issues, you know, your first year, your second year, your third year. After Vegan Soul Fest launched, I felt I was comfortable enough to take on this other project, Black Vegetarian Society of Maryland. And what we did with that group, that Facebook group, we just turned it into a nonprofit and it became a 501c3. And we went out into the community with vegan products, your milks, your sandwiches, deli meats, anything that you can get at a Target or a Walmart or a Giant or uh, the Whole Foods for people to try to give them a chance to know and feel the vegan food is not bad. They got some incredible taste in it. It's just a matter of a journey. Which milk do you like? Which deli slice do you like? Which cheese do you like? So just teaching them where they can get these products and uh, looking at the ingredients. And we would be out there with the fish fry, vegan fish fry, things like that, burgers. And that's what the, um, the Black Vest Society was doing initially. And then we just started planning uh, our pillars where we would have the education, we would have something on empowerment, we would have something on, um, you know, enrichment and then events. So there's different pillars if you go to the site blackvestsociety.org that we touch on. And it's not like this big membership society. The society is, the society is a membership of a referral. So we have health coaches and we have farmers and we have restaurateurs and Farmer Nell was here earlier. He's on the board too. So we have those type of resources in the society where we can say, hey, you're looking for that. You want to know they got it here. Yo, you looking for this? They so this is what we're doing with uh, the society. And COVID gave us the opportunity to really reach beyond Maryland. So the rebranding to Black Veg Society came through because now I'm connected with uh, countries in Africa. So now I'm doing presentations out there, teaching them how to do veg fest and vegan restaurant weeks and things like that. So it's not, we're based in Baltimore, we're operating in Maryland, but we also have this extended reach to share our best practices and teach people what we're doing so they can veganize or plant-based their communities as well. I, uh, well, just to add on to it, like the basis was also that we were going out personally doing uh education things so we were going to schools teaching them how to make salads doing food demos and it was just too much to do the restaurant and mm -hmm. the social stuff too so we needed to build a broader network and that's kind of how the that's also how the uh the nonprofit came out as well it's like how can we team up with other people and bring their specialties to the community on a broader scale as well. And and like not just well, two things. Like not just said the um, 
you know, it's a it's a global at this point. I mean, she's she's done demos and had conversations with people in Uganda, uh, Nigeria. Uh, am I missing somewhere? South Africa, Tanzania. Tanzania, South Africa. So this is this has become the Black Vet Society has become a global thing. And just lastly, um, not just kind of underscoring what Vegan Soul Fest is and what it was when it first started. It was 1500 people and this festival that was in this building that expanded out around the city block and into an alleyway and the alleyway portion was so popular with the food vendors like they were like next year can we do it in the alley again you know so this was something that just kind of wrapped around the city block that started out with 1500 people expanded to the college campuses that this year we had uh 15,000 people out there for vegan soul fest a two-day event fifteen thousand tickets sold um and it was so it was so big that it was just difficult for people just to even get in the park so that's how big this thing is probably one of the it's probably one of the biggest vegan festivals on the east coast i would i would say like i haven't heard of anything quite that big but you know we'll see i'm going to vegan dale this weekend so <laughs> it's good work thank you for that um, I do have a question for you, Yolande. Um, how has Baltimore's vacant lot program specifically benefited efforts to expand community and urban gardens? And what measurable outcomes or, or improvements have been observed in areas where it has been implemented? I'm actually not familiar with that program. Okay, okay, no worries. So I am maybe in your opinion, what okay so as food deserts are such a huge concern in urban planning um how is how is the city working to improve this access in underserved communities and what um and i guess how do food deserts food swamps and food apartheid differ in their approaches um to addressing disparities in access to healthy food options i know you've mentioned trans transportation being an, a really big issue so um, is that something you can speak to in this question? Besides transportation, I should say. Um, so, yeah, so, um, yes, Baltimore City is definitely a, um, there are areas that we call um, healthy food priority areas where there is a, a high need for healthy food access in those, in those portions of the city. Um, so our office, we try our best to focus on efforts that are sustainable. Um, so when I talk about like the, the uh, produce box distribution program, we at our office consider, do, do not consider that program to be sustainable, mainly because it's, um, it, it's, it's funded through, um, the, the funding can disappear is what I'm trying to say <laughs> at, at, at any time the funding can disappear. So we try to focus our efforts on things that will inform policy later on um, or, or uh, efforts that are more um, sustainable. So we, a lot of feedback we get at our offices, how can we get a grocery store in this community um, or what can we do to attract them? And it's, it's sad that, um, these uh, larger grocery stores do not want to come to Baltimore City uh, for various different reasons. Um, so our office definitely focuses on one, urban agriculture. Um, that's why we put a lot of the funding um, towards the farm incubator to teach farmers how to expand their um, gardens and businesses and begin to sell their produce um, wholesale. Um, also, we have, we recently, um, launched uh, something called Open Access in partnership with Morgan State University. So it's a, a platform for uh, food entrepreneurs um, and teaches them uh, or gives them access to information on like permits and licensing and just makes the process a lot easier for them. Uh, we also have um, healthy food priority area funds. Um, so we do fund a lot of farmers markets. Um, so basically like empowering the community um empowering the community and stakeholders in the community to help you know rectify the disparity when it comes to um grocery stores being in the area 
Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Can, can um, I add on to that? Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Baltimore has a ton of uh, urban farms that are that are in some of these communities or close to these to these communities. You have White Lock Farm. Um, uh, you have Strength of Love Farm. So there there are just a lot of farms. But back to the point of education, the point is, is educating people on what to do with this produce and get, getting them engaged in actually using the produce. There are a ton of these local farms and I've seen the city use some of these vacant or I've seen communities use some of these vacant lots to do uh, urban gardens, um, whether it's just for an aesthetic piece or actually just uh, growing uh, food and produce. Uh, the gentleman that was here earlier today, Heber Brown, Heber actually uh, developed a church network where the churches turned some of their property into urban farms to show them how to provide food for their particular communities. So the work is going on, but then there's the back piece of it because because you have to integrate, you're integrating people's cultural I, or, or tradition and and cultural ideologies around food uh what has happened because the markets have left the city for whatever whatever reasons they've left they they've left the city so what happened was that generations of people have now gone to fast food so they're used to going to 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 the chinese store or the chicken box spot and that that's how they eat you know because it's cheap and it's quick but now, you know, our role, or I know specifically Land of Kush or the Black Veg Society, our role is to educate people on how to, you know, incorporate these things and start to change cultural, tradi traditional uh, uh, family ideologies around food and how to, you know, just incorporate these things into their into their diets because it's difficult for people to change those things. But the urban farms are out there. There are a ton of them. Um, there are a ton of there are a ton of farms in, in Baltimore that are that are that are just all around the city. As as a matter of fact, just as one example, uh, it's a couple, an older couple called the Blues in Northeast Baltimore, which is right down the street from where I grew up. But in there, they converted their backyard into a farm. And what they what happened was is that they converted their backyard to a farm, and then the neighbors in that surrounding area. In the connected backyards, they all said, look, we'll give you a portion of our backyards so that you can expand this farm. So this farm is huge and he's growing everything from African okra, peppers. I've never tasted I've never eaten food like right off the vine before. And I grew up in that area. But, you know, I grew up I'm a city kid. So, like, I'm not used to eating fresh food off of a vine. You know, but I, you know, but but going out to his farm, which is you, you would drive by, you you would totally miss it if you drove by the drove by their street. But they converted their farm, their backyard, and portions of their neighbor's backyard into this huge farm. So, wow, um, yeah, for sure. Greg said mentioned about being able to pick something to eat. I had said that earlier. Getting those programs to children. It's a very, very enlightening and inspiring experience when you know where your food comes from and you can see it come from off the vine or on, from the ground and you compare it. My, my daughter picked a cucumber, well, you know, like when we, we uh, were on a field trip. It's, it's a whole different experience. Mm -hmm. So we have to get into doing those programs. And one point with the Black Veg Society, I go out and do interviews through uh, my Naja Speaks platform and I also uncover a lot of things. There is a big farm out in Poolsville that is run by an organization called Afri Thrive, and they are growing food for African immigrants in Baltimore because it's a cultural thing. They have cultural African foods that they're growing. So this is a really, really, and they have a big, big farm out in Poolsville. Oh, thank you so much. I think at this point, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, maybe I'll ask one more question and then we'll get some more questions from the audience. Um, so I have, um, we were speaking about farms. I mean, these are uh, uh, positive farms. So now I'm, I'm gonna switch to the negative ones. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. It's This is actually directed to you, Nigel, oh, or anyone else who wants to join in, but 
can you share um, about the impact of concentrated animal farming operations and the farming industry on our environment and how veganism is supportive of environmental health and reduces food waste? Well, I, I always say when I go out and garbage in, garbage out, if, if a bunch of us are in this room, a thousand of us are in this room and, and we're urinating and, you know, defecating and doing all that stuff all day, <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? You know, disease. So that's what's happening in these animal farms. You know, they're tightly caged. Uh, they're not allowed to to walk around and graze and do all this stuff. So um, this is what people are eating, this mass production of stuff. It's also messing up the environment, you know, the flatulence, the, you know, just about all of these, these animals doing this. If you have pets, more than one, you know, just two, we have two cats. So just imagine <laughs> pigs and cows, you know, it's, 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 disgusting and it's filthy i'm sorry and i, I wouldn't eat it and and we, we have to make sure people are aware that unless you know where the food is coming from this is what it is and this is what you're eating and you're talking about uh diseases that are pandemics and it's zoonotic stuff it's because of animals and this type of stuff that's going on and you can give them all the antibiotics you want but it's not working they're becoming resistant to it from an environmental standpoint, what happens is, is the runoff from the waste of these animals is a lot of times directed uh, directed to poor communities and they are impacted um, from uh, whether it's air pollution, whether um, it's just into the soil or into the waterways. Um, what is it called? Oh, oh, the smell of money documentary speaks mm -hmm. to this. But the runoff, uh, uh, all these things, when you're talking environmental environmental issues, a lot of the, the waste and runoff from whether it's from waste companies, whether it's from factory farming, a lot of this, um, the waste from this is either dumped into communities or communities are right next to these type of situations. And because they're poorer or because, you know, is African American or Latinx or whatever, or they're from other countries and they've just settled into Baltimore or whatever the areas are, they don't have a particular voice. And this is what happens is like their communities are impacted. The waterways are, are impacted. There are certain waterways that are, that are devastated, that are, that you, you may even look at them and look, Oh, they, you know, that looks like, you know, good, good scenery, but the waters are impacting there are things that are going on within the water that you can't see. There are things that until you smelled fresh air, until you've been around fresh air, and then you go back into the city or you go into these communities and you're like, yo, you know, there's, there's a complete difference. And, you know, it's one thing to go into a community and say, oh man, it smells terrible over here. You know, that's, that's disgusting. And then you go back home. Okay. You got the right to go back home, but there are people living in this every single day and they are impacted, um, health wise. They're, there are so many diseases that come out of this, um, and it's not just from the factory farming, but the factory farming plays a big, a big part. But just within the city, just waste in general is associated with, um, with these, with these communities, and then that that leads to uh, not just poor health, but poor physical health, but poor mental health. Then that trickles down into the children. Okay, they're eating poor foods, they're breathing poor quality air, they're drinking poor quality water, and then they're expected to learn and educate themselves. And then we go back and look at them and say, why aren't you doing well in school? Well, they don't know that they've been negatively impacted. And not to say that people don't come out of these schools and do great things. Of course, they're lawyers and doctors, but there are so many children that are impacted by lead poisoning still. Because people were at, at one point in time, they were trying to grow produce in these particular areas, but there was so much lead in the soil that they couldn't even grow the produce. So now they've had to go to raised gardens because they can't grow because the soil is so damaged. Now, people were living in this condition for decades. They've been living in these conditions and still in these conditions because Baltimore has such a high vacant house. Um, 
situation going on within the city. So a lot of these houses are still in existence. It's just that people haven't turned them over. So just because you see one scenic piece or you see a, a portion of redevelopment that's going on, it doesn't mean that a block away that they're still led in, in particular houses or that these environmental issues are, aren't still located within these communities. And so those are the things that, that happen with this, you know, you know, big corporation and, and, and not following up on the citizens. It's great to see Baltimore come alive through South Baltimore, but where's the funding and the redevelopment for the communities, for the poor communities that haven't had access to the funds so that you can make change over decades to help people grow and, and, and change mind states. Absolutely, 100% agreed. Um, additionally, the smell of money will be played at the end after the closing plenary today. Great. So oh. it will be, um, I believe it's from 6.15 to 8.30 if you're interested. Yeah. Closing reception and documentary viewing. Um, so with that being said, I will open up the floor to the audience. If you have any questions, we have just maybe over 10 minutes, maybe 13 to be exact you. for your opening. Mm -hmm. This was a really great session, so feel free. Um, I will say whomever wants to um, ask a question, I was, I was requested to come up and get the microphone. I'll come to you. Um, so yeah, anyone I'm seeing your hands? <laughs> People on the stream these days. So. Absolutely. Um, Hi, I'm, I'm Rachel Marston. Uh, I work at Environmental Defense Fund and the Frontline Resource Institute. Um, this is a great panel. Um, I was just wondering, specifically talking about access to food education, what are some of the biggest challenges in making sure that frontline, fence line, marginalized communities have access to that food education in, in all of your efforts? This is to, to all of the panelists. The biggest, I mean, I have a large voice, so. Go ahead, The biggest issue is uh, you can, we cannot uh, wait for the people to come to us. Just, to, just because we set up a restaurant and says land of Kush and we want to educate people on food, that is, that, that's an issue in and of itself because it presumes people are just going to come to you. So the biggest issue is like finding out where we need to be, you know, okay, do I, do I need to talk to the elementary school kids? Do I need to talk to the middle school kids? Do I need to talk to the, do I need to go into senior homes? Do I need to go to the churches? Do I need to go to community organizations? And all of that is yes. And, and, and then for us, because it's vegan and because vegan is, is, is kind of small in its niche, while it's more well known now, it's still convincing organizations that, you know, we have a voice that you may need to get to your particular audience and to your particular organization. So we have to sell the idea of bringing us in and having us do a demo or having us come in and do catering, you know, have us provide food or even if you're doing a food event. You know, OK, you can do whatever regular food you want, but just have us come in and do a portion of the food, you know. So it's convincing organizations to have us come in and do those particular things and talk to the to the community. Yeah. And just to add to that, we've also partnered with organizations that have been doing programs for, for children. So but we'd like to do our own because a lot of times we do feel the tokenization. We would like to get funded for our own stuff. So for you ask it that when you say did you want to respond? Um, I think we have a we have a question from one of this. So okay. we'll probably leave it up to you. Thank you. Yes. So the question is, knowing that funding is always an issue, what are the ways in which the panelists have created alter alternative streams of income that is connected with addressing food insecurities in Baltimore? And this is from Aika Solutions Incorporated. Alternative streams of income? Uh. <laughs> I mean, the only... 
the only option that I had this year or last year was when we made the decision to uh, have the ticketed Vegan Soul Fest because at the end, that funding goes to the two nonprofits that put it together. And this year was an okay year, but it needs to be better. So we need people supporting things. Everything can't be free. We do a lot of stuff throughout the year that's free. When it becomes that one thing that we're fundraising and we're asking you to pay, we need that money mm -hmm. and we need you to pay. <laughs> I think just in general is just, I think for us is maximizing our brand. So just like we're at an event like this, we may go out and do speaking events. We go to vegan festivals across the country, been to San Antonio and and uh, oh, we've been to Tallahassee all over the place. We went to Tallahassee this year. So um, we, we create separate income in terms of that, in terms of um, whether going out to speak and just maximizing our brand so that we can funnel money into other projects and do things for the community so i think that's the that's the biggest thing is just us maximizing our brand because now i'm just thinking like okay my wife has not just speaks where she has her platform and she's speaking to social justice issues now i want to do my platform and my platform needs to be in the kitchen so i think you know that's that's going to be next for me okay thank you so much does, uh, does that answer the question i, I just want to make sure. definitely okay. and i think well uh, yoanda i'm not sure if we spoke about funding i know you said that if the funding goes you know it can go like that so i know the question was posed to all of you i don't want you to feel you know yeah far. um yeah most of our offices uh funding is either like city level or federal um, we do have some relationships with foundations like the ABLE Foundation. Um, if there's like an initiative that comes up, we do have the um, we do have the ability to uh, reach out to them and see if they'd be interested in funding one of our initiatives. Uh, but yeah, as far as like um, selling things or um, creating streams of income through the city, we, we don't do that. OK, thank you so much. And thank you to our panelists. I think we're uh, about that time. We have about two minutes. Um, you know, please feel free right now in these last few minutes to shameless plug anything yes. that you have upcoming, um, everyone. So we have. <laughs> okay, everybody get their pens out. There's a lot. Okay. <laughs> So, and I'll let Greg deal with his marketing. With Black Vet Society, please go to blackvetsociety.org. That is where you're going to find everything we're working on and the projects. There's three major ones. Naja Speaks, which is me interviewing people in, about food, culture, events, Vegan Soul Fest, and Maryland Vegan Restaurant Month for now. What's coming up? We have a web three part webinar series uh, through Black Veg in partnership with the Plant Protocol. They will be teaching. Uh, everyone's getting into health coaching and things like that. This is a certified plant based uh, certification course. She will be teaching the business of that. So those people getting into coaching, health coaching, we will be rolling out a three part series. It is free. That starts October 11th. So just follow us on blackvistsociety.org. You'll be getting that information because we'll be I'll be interviewing her again next Thursday at 11. Um, that's what's coming up right now. <laughs> so <laughs> the latest thing. Uh, you can always visit the land of Kush, uh, 840 North Utah Street in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, find us on the Web, uh, landofkush.com. You can find us on Facebook or uh, Instagram or TikTok. Okay. 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 Facebook, Instagram, um, <laughs> Twitter, and we're X. And then we're um, we're actually launching a second location in Baltimore, where we've torn down two buildings and we're building it back up from scratch. So that's about six or seven months away, roughly. So that's going to be probably quadruple the size of the restaurant space that we have now. So it's going to be an eighty seat restaurant. So look for that. But definitely, I know you all are down this way, but come up and see us. My brother's a graduate of College Park. He now teaches. He's a professor at Howard University right now. So I just want to shout out my brother, <laughs> Johnny Graham. Okay. Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining us for um, session 2F, Food Justice in Baltimore. And thank you to our panelists. I mentioned before, all of the work you're doing is extremely impactful. 
especially in this this time right now moving forward. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of the session. And so have a good evening. Thank you.